All right, good morning, everyone. Let's stand and worship together, our God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful this morning to be in your presence. And Lord, as we come in this morning with hearts heavy in many cases, we recognize that there is no one greater than you. And no matter what we're facing, Lord, we thank you that you are greater and that we have the opportunity to be on your side. Father, I pray that as we come together today that you would help us to, um, to rest our minds, to rest our anxious thoughts, and focus on who you are, how awesome you are, in the next few hours. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And you may be seated. Well, we are very glad that you're here this morning with us, and uh, we're excited to see what God is going to do today. A um, couple of announcements as we go through the, the week this week. Uh, today at 4.30, we will have our discipleship meeting. And then uh, 
Next Sunday, immediately following the morning service, will be a nursery workers meeting. If you have any questions on that, you can see Jerry Lynn or Karen. Uh, if you're interested in working in the nursery, then uh, you, this is a meeting that will uh, be a part of that process, so they'll be happy to explain that to you. Um, children's quizzing teen, uh, tonight at 6, teen quizzing immediately following the service uh, today, the morning service. And then next Saturday will be an all-church uh, family fellowship at Mike and Lisa Davis's home in Bettendorf. The address is there in the bulletin if you're interested in coming to that. It'll be a great time just to uh, fellowship together. Um, today is... Uh, our alabaster Sunday, and we're going to do that this week, and we'll also take our alabaster offering next week as well, in case you forgot your boxes. Um, with the alabaster, and I have a video in there, Dacian, in the folder. I don't know if you can look it up in the PowerPoints for Sunday folder I forgot to tell you about. Um, power, or alabaster within the Nazarene Church is an a opportunity when we collect change throughout the year, and we take that change and we pool it with change from all across the world. Um, it's interesting, this year we crossed a very significant uh, number in that alabaster collection. And uh, as they're getting the video together, I'll go ahead and tell you, this year they, they crossed the line of $100 million collected for the building of church buildings, missionary homes, hospitals, clinics, all around the world. $100 million worth of change. Isn't that a lot of money? A lot of pennies, nickels, dimes, and quarters. And uh, so the alabaster offering that we take uh, is where we bring our change in and where we see that change make a difference throughout the world. Are you not finding it? It may be in the wrong format, too. I didn't even check that. So, Okay, we'll, we'll catch it next week. Um, for the alabaster offering, oh, there it goes. Just imagine a world where... Pastors and missionaries have a place to live. Students have a place to study. Families have a place to receive health care. And everyone has a place to learn about Jesus Christ. You have been a part of making this dream come true for people in need all over the world. The Nazarene Missions International Alabaster Offerings have raised over a hundred million dollars to fund building projects that have impacted countless lives. Certainly, a community is more than its buildings, but Alabaster Projects help empower people by providing spaces to gather, learn, and live life together as the church. These permanent structures are a reminder to the community that the church isn't leaving. Give through the Alabaster Offering this year and help build a better future as God works in building projects across the globe. All right. Um, Alabaster, the collection place for that is in the foyer. So as you leave today, or you may have done it on your way in, just drop the, the money in the, the little church there, and then we'll have that out again next Sunday as well. All right, well, I think that's all the announcements we have for this morning. So let's uh, stand together as we continue to worship with Everlasting God.
I know that um, sometimes our problems just seem really overwhelming. As we think of the, the things that we're facing, the realities that we're facing, um, it can really, really overwhelm us. But this morning as we come into this place, no matter what we're facing, it's nothing compared to who He is. And as we sing through this praise chorus again, as we not just give lip service to this, but what would it mean if we actually exalted Him? Recognizing Him for who He is and recognizing how weak we are in comparison. And then we have the opportunity to come before this God and present our needs, our concerns to Him. As we sing through this prayer chorus again, our altars are are open. Uh, If you would like to be seated, if you'd like to remain standing, whatever is the least distractive for you as we approach our God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to be able to come before you. As we recognize our inability to handle so many of the things in our lives, as we recognize how overwhelming things seem so much of the time, as we watch as the world around us faces crises after crises and turmoil after turmoil, we are driven to the point where we have to acknowledge we can't do this on our own. Father, this morning as we gather, we're thinking through so many things and processing so many things and worried about so many things. And we take time now to lay all of those things at the feet of the one who can actually do something. And we take a moment of silent prayer to lay these requests at your feet. Father, this morning we lift up the needs of those in our congregation. We continue to pray for Jamie Scanlon as she's recovering from surgery. We pray for Anderson Osan, who we dedicated just a few weeks ago and is now in the Iowa City Hospital. Doctors are unsure exactly what's going on. Father, I pray that you would be with little Anderson in a very, very special way that you would give the doctors and the nurses the wisdom and the discernment to know exactly what they need to do. And Father, be with Adam and Aaron in this time. They're so exhausted. They've had so many challenges one after the other. And I just pray that you'll be with their family during this time. Hold them close to you. And Father, we pray for your touch upon Anderson. Father, we pray also for Dale Dick, who uh, leaves in the morning for Afghanistan. And with all of the unrest and his wife just having a, a brand new baby last in the last couple of weeks, I pray, Father, that you would be with Dale and with Crystal and their family. Father, we pray that you would keep your hand of protection around Dale, that you would send your angels to guard him during this time. Father, we continue to lift up those of our shut-ins, those within our church family that are struggling physically and We pray for Cheryl Lehmans, for Amy Adkins, for Dolores Hayden and Carl Jones. And we pray, Father, for for your hand to be upon each one of them in the situations that they're facing. 
Father, we thank you that you never leave us or forsake us. No matter what we're facing, you are with us. Father, we pray this morning that you would help us as a church to recognize what you want us to be. Continue to speaking to speak into our hearts and continue open doors that we may walk through them and be the church that you want us to be. As we continue to read through your word, may you continue to speak to us, challenge us, force us to step back and ask questions, recognizing that we cannot do this on our own power, but that only through your strength and your your power can we accomplish what you are calling us to do. Father, in all of this, keep our eyes focused on you and the big picture. May we not be distracted by details, but may we focus on the big picture of what you're wanting to do. Father, as we close this time of prayer, we say together the prayer that your son taught us to pray. Not out of habit, but out of a true desire for this prayer to be answered in our lives. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And you may be seated.
Amen. And you may be seated. If our ushers would come forward at this time, we'll take our morning tithes and offerings. Jack, would you pray for our offering this morning? Heavenly Father, we do thank you for that victory. We were destined to hell, but you give us a chance for eternal life. Help us to return back to you what you deserve. Bless this offering. Amen. Amen. Thank you to our worship team this morning for a wonderful job of leading us in worship. As we continue through our New Testament in a year reading um, this week, we dealt with some of the big stuff that churches need to deal with. We dealt with the, uh, the conflict that was taking place in Corinth And quite honestly, a lot of these conflicts still take place in churches today. You would think that something that started 2,000 years ago would have been dealt with by now, wouldn't you? If Paul designated a ton of space in in these letters to, to deal with these issues, you'd think that we would have gotten them by now. But the truth is, we haven't. There are a lot of areas where we have a lot of work to do. And as we work through the, uh, the reading this morning, I, I want you to know that the passage today, passages today, we're going to look at a couple of chapters, should cause us to ask some pretty big questions. And quite honestly, we're not going to solve this today. But we need to ask the question, what would it look like? What would it look like? Paul starts out 1 Corinthians chapter 12 by saying this. I don't want you to misunderstand this. When I, when I have to preface a statement with, I don't want you to misunderstand this, it usually means that there's about a 99% chance that you're going to misunderstand this. And so I want you to think about the fact that I don't want you to misunderstand this. When we, when we look at this passage, what would it look like, and I don't want you to misunderstand this, I want you to step back, and instead of listening to this passage as we always listen to passages, listen to this passage with open ears and an open heart. Now, dear brothers and sisters, regarding your question about the special abilities the Spirit gives us, I don't want you to misunderstand this. You know that when you were still pagans, you were led astray and swept along in worship, worshiping speechless idols. So I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God will curse Jesus, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who works in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. 
To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another, and someone else, the Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles, and another per- the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all of these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, some are free, but we have all been baptized into one body by the one Spirit, and we all share the same Spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I am not a part of the body because I am not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I am not a part of the body because I am not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? If your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it only had one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some of the parts of the body that seem the weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honorable parts do not require this special care. So God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members, so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. Am I not plugged in? Is that why we're jumping around? Something's going on. As we look at this passage of Scripture, there are several key pieces that I want us to to pay attention to today. Again, keep in mind that Paul says, I don't want you to misunderstand this. So there's a 99% chance that we will, unless we give special attention. The first thing that Paul points out that I want us to catch is in verse 4, when Paul says, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts. But the Spirit, the same Spirit, is the source of them all. Do you realize how diverse we are as a group of people? Take a moment and look around. Not just at your spouses, you do that enough, you know how weird they are. But look around at how diverse of a group of people we are. We don't look like each other. We don't act like each other. We don't talk like each other. We're diverse. We're different. And as we are different, we have different gifts and abilities. It takes all of our gifts working together. And that's why the Spirit gave each one of us different gifts. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. That means that my gifts, even though they're very different from yours, are not wrong. That means the Spirit has given me gifts and given me purposes, things that I am supposed to accomplish. And the Spirit has given you gifts and abilities and things that you're supposed to accomplish. A spiritual gift is given to each one of us so that we can help each other. Here's where the rub comes in a little bit. In America today, we think that our gifts are for our benefit. After all, it is all about me, isn't it? Now, if you're here last week, you know that it's not all about us. But a spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. The Spirit gives us gifts... Because he expects us to help each other. He expects us to be a part of something bigger than ourselves where we don't just look at poor me in the mirror. 
where we recognize that there are others who have needs. And my gifts are designed to fit with their needs. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. I want you to look at that for a minute. It's something that makes perfect sense to all of us. There's not a single person in this room that would think anything different. How many of you have had in the last 10 years any surgical procedure? How many of you have had more than one on the same thing? <laughs> when, when you have a surgical procedure, it's because something in your body is not working right. It takes all of our body parts working together so that we can exist. I, I read last night just on the digestive process. The Mayo Clinic has a great... Uh, spot on their website where it walks through the digestive process and what happens and I can't remember it all I'm not a medical person but you know just the ability for us to ingest food and it has the example of a piece of apple pie the way that our our mouths will create saliva so that the food can be digested so the way that our esophagus muscles will pull the food downward into our stomach and the way that the stomach then pulls the nutrients out and pulls the waste out and separates and through the small intestines and all, the way that our body processes things is amazing. Now, if we didn't have all of the pieces and parts that we have, just take out the stomach, for example. How much would you enjoy a piece of apple pie? You would enjoy apple pie as well as I enjoy broccoli. Not at all. It wouldn't do any good. You'd put it down there and it'd stay down there. Till it rotted. There's nothing to, to digest it. There's nothing to make it work. It takes all of our parts working together. Because we're one body. We're not the whole body in and of ourselves. My finger is very necessary. I use this finger daily for many things. Can you imagine how hard it would be to operate a touchscreen phone without fingers? I do have a clock on my phone just in case you're wondering. I do look at what time it is. I just don't care. We have... Every piece of our body has a purpose. Our toes? Try walking without our toes and see how much you actually use them. Every piece of our body works together and it makes up the whole. That part makes perfect sense. What doesn't make sense is what Paul says next. So it is with the body of Christ. So it is with the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. And my question, the first question that you saw in the title of my sermon, what would it look like? My question this morning is this. What would it look like if the body of Christ worked well together? What would it look like if the body of Christ worked well together? I read a little bit this week in Chuck Colson's book, The Body. And he's talking about the body of Christ and, and talking about what the body of Christ should be. But he has to spend way too many chapters talking about what it actually is. You see, we as a church, and we're not the first ones, that's why this is written to the church in Corinth. We as a church so often miss the point about what it is to be the body of Christ. We get so focused on our own little areas that we miss the big picture of what God is doing in the world. In case you're wondering, the point of life is not to build a retirement account. The point of life 
is not just to drive the nicest, newest, or to have the fastest, newest iPhone 5 to... That's not the point of life. There were articles that I saw on the internet this week, what to do with an old iPhone. Because they sold out of the iPhone 5s. I mean, they're, they're already sold out of the first release of them. What do you do with your old iPhone? How many hundreds of dollars did you spend on that thing? Oh, it's not worth anything now. If you're chasing after the newest, latest, best, it will very soon be replaced. And it's no longer the newest, latest, best. If you're chasing after the retirement account, it's going to drop. Or your kids are going to waste it one way or the other. The point of life is not to chase after money or things. The point of life is to represent Christ as his body. Just as our human bodies have many parts and they all work together, so it is with the body of Christ. Paul approaches that from the positive and then he turns around and approaches it from the negative. The body has many different parts, not just one part. What if one part said, I don't need the other? Now, I've never heard my hand talking to my foot, but I suppose it might. I've never felt the two of them arguing about whether which one was the more necessary, but maybe they do. You recognize how goofy Paul's statement is here, but yet how true it is. You recognize that all of our body parts depend on and need one another if they are going to work as they're supposed to. As good of a job as my teeth do at crunching up that piece of apple pie to get it on its way through the digestive system, if there's nothing on the other end or if my stomach revolts and says I'm not taking it, then it doesn't matter how good of a job my teeth do. It doesn't matter how good my saliva glands do if there's a problem down lower. It doesn't matter if if one part of the body isn't working, it doesn't matter how good of a job the other parts do. All of our all of our parts have to work together, or else we don't have the whole body. Over the last couple, actually it's over the last year, I've been dealing with blood sugar issues. My blood sugar issues come from my addiction to soda. I was addicted to soda for at least 15 years, finally broke myself of that addiction, and then my body went into revolt. I thought it would thank me, but it went into revolt. Because for 15 years, I have been drinking my calories. I don't, I don't eat a ton, but I drink sodas constantly. I'd get up, I'd go to the fridge, I'd get a soda. The problem is that my body did not know when I stopped drinking soda, it's like, where are the calories coming from? And so my sugar was all over the board. I'm not diabetic yet, but I'm close to it, but it's, I just, I jump up and I crash and I'm all over the board because it's so used to that steady stream of calories from my soda. Over the last year, I, I have struggled physically because when my sugar is not acting like it's supposed to, I can't even think straight. Some of you may think, well, that's normal for you, isn't it? When my sugar's out of whack, I can't think straight. I, I can't process things. Janelle will say something three times and I still don't get what she said. Some of you are nodding your heads. You understand. You've been there. If one part of my body is out of whack, then the rest of my body doesn't feel right. If I've got, Bill, if you've got a broken ankle, you really don't care what your head feels like, do you? No. If your ankle is is broken like yours was this past summer, you weren't sitting there thinking, well, I'm glad my fingers are all intact. (laughs) You're thinking, I need help with this ankle. When one part of the body is out of whack... It messes with the whole body. From a positive perspective, Paul tells us 
that the, all the parts make up the body. And from the negative perspective, Paul tells us, if you don't have all the parts, it's not going to work. How weird would it look if your body were all an eye? Think about that. If your whole body was an eye, you'd see great for the first week and then you'd die because you didn't have any nourishment. There's nothing in your body that's designed to take in nourishment. The eye doesn't work unless you feed it. Unless you get oxygen to it. You see, all the pieces have to work together. I love this part. God has put each part just where He wants it. God has put each part just where He wants it. You realize how funny you would look if your hand stuck out of the middle of your back? How useful would your hand be if it stuck out your back like that? You can't see what you're doing? The hand goes at the end of the arm so that it's usable, right? Now these are goofy illustrations, but Paul uses them so I get a chance to be corny too. God put each part just where it's supposed to be so that it works. And when it's not, it's not wanting to work or it's saying, I don't want to work, then the whole part. What is the point of an arm if it doesn't have a hand attached? How well does your arm work if the hand is not attached? How well does your leg work if there's not a foot attached? doesn't work. All of the parts have to be in just the right place in order for them to work together. All of the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. If one part suffers, all of the parts suffer with it. When my blood sugar was acting up, it wasn't just my blood sugar, it was my whole body that wasn't feeling right. When your leg was, or when your ankle was broken, it wasn't just your ankle, it was your whole body that didn't feel right. It was just all off balance. When you go and visit someone who's had surgery, and I get to do that frequently, there's this process of healing that takes place. And when things aren't working well, man, just one part being out of whack messes the whole system up, and feel terrible just because one part's out of whack. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. If one part is honored, all the parts are glad. You know, it's exciting when our body, after you've gone through the the healing process and your body starts to do what it's supposed to. As I've figured out what's going on with my blood sugar, I've been able to regulate my diet in such a way that you know what, I'm okay with this now. I don't even need coffee as much as I needed coffee over the last year because I'm, okay. I'm getting the nutrients when I need them. Bill, it is awesome to see you up and walking around compared to where you were a few months ago, laying in bed and frustrated and driving your wife crazy. <laughs> because now that the parts are working, it's, it's, it's honored, it's exciting to see things working the way that they're supposed to. But I'm going to ask this question again. What would it look like if the body of Christ were to work well together? Let's rewind a little bit. What does the body of Christ, what is it supposed to accomplish? We talked about this a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about building something, whether you're building a building or whether a child is growing up, whether you're planting a field and preparing for harvest, there's a process that's supposed to take place. There's an end in mind. And that end is that we would would grow to maturity, that we would plant and reap a bountiful harvest, or that we would build a building that would reflect well on the builder.
if the body of Christ doesn't work well together, what are the ramifications? Our purpose is to reflect Jesus Christ in this world. That's our purpose. To be His disciples so that we reflect Him well. So that others who do not know Him can see Him in us. Individually, but as a congregation. When one part doesn't work well, it doesn't reflect Christ well, does it? When one part gets rattled, what a mess. If you don't believe me, just go and watch the replay of Thursday night's football game. Right, Dacian? I had to get it in there. The text that he sent me, or the Facebook message you sent me last week, I had to reply. But looking at the process, which I'm sure Jay Cutler is doing and the entire Bears staff is doing, what gets Jay Cutler so rattled? All the other teams in the NFL are saying, what can we do to get him that rattled? Because it's great. But you see, when one player gets rattled, what a mess. It doesn't work well together. If one part isn't working, the whole thing suffers. If one part is honored, all the parts are glad. If our purpose as the body of Christ is to reflect Him, how do you think we're doing? How do you think we as a church collectively are doing at reflecting Jesus Christ in the Quad Cities? Look at how many empty pews there are. If we were reflecting the truth of who Jesus Christ is, there wouldn't be very many empty pews in this building. How many people are there in the Quad Cities? Between 350 and 400,000? That's a whole lot of people. We've only got 280 seats in here. Perhaps we're not doing a very good job of reflecting Christ. And quite honestly, we're growing, so we're doing better than many churches are. But that doesn't mean that we're doing all that we should be doing, does it? Why not? There's a a number of reasons why not. There's a number of reasons why we as, as the church are missing the mark. How many of you have ever heard of John Wesley? John Wesley was the founder of our version of Christianity, our denomination, He founded the United Methodist Church, which we came out of. John Wesley preached a sermon in 1778 where he was addressing the work of God in North America. This sermon, actually, as it was reflected in one of the books I read in my master's program, is what stimulated my interest and passion for discipleship. And I want you to to read what, what he had to say. As he's trying to piece together what has happened in North America... 1778, just to put this in perspective, what's going on in the United States in 1778? And who are they fighting? Great Britain. Just so you know, John Wesley was British. And his concern was not the Americans or the Redcoats. His concern was the spiritual development of Christians. That should tell you something. He's struggling with a man named George Whitfield who had been preaching in America, had brought about the first great awakening revival in America. And he says this, What wonder, it was a true saying which was common in the ancient church, the soul and body make a man and the spirit and discipline make a Christian. 
But those who were more or less affected by Mr. Whitfield's preaching had no discipline at all. They had no shadow of discipline, nothing of the kind. They were formed into no societies. They had no Christian connection with each other, nor were ever taught to watch over each other's souls. So that if they fell into lukewarmness or into sin, he had none to lift him up. He may fall lower and lower, yea, into hell, if he would, for who had regarded it? One of the reasons that this struck me is the reality that we still do not do well with forming the disciplines and discipleship within the church. I don't want to see a show of hands on this, but how many of you wake up every day and the first question on your mind is, how can I be a better disciple today? Part of the reasons I don't want to see a show of hands is because I don't know that there would be any. When we first wake up in the morning, our questions are, what do I have to do today? Can I hit snooze one more time? What day is this? What's got to be done today? We're not thinking about how we can work together to reflect Christ in this world. We're not thinking about how can we be the body of Christ? How can I encourage someone? How can I love someone? We're thinking about that snooze bar or what's for breakfast. How many sick days do I have left? What would it look like If we were the body of Christ, and if we were working together well. Every part is necessary. Every part needs to do its part. And every part is just where God wanted it. So John Wesley built a system of organization of discipleship in Great Britain that averted a civil war that would have taken place incidentally the same time that the British were fighting us. Through this organization and the focus on discipleship, he averted the civil war between the classes in Great Great Britain. In John Wesley's system, you were organized into three groups. You had a band, which is you and one or two other people. You would meet weekly and be asked hard questions by your band members. Your band members would be of the same age, approximate income level, same sex, so men would meet with men, women would meet with women. And they would ask you every day or every week, how are you doing, how are you growing, what are you struggling with? What is keeping you from experiencing the grace of God? Then there were the classes, which is a group of 10 to 12 people, and the classes would also ask you tough questions. If there was a need that someone experienced, it was the class that would take care of that need. The finances were all handled in the class, and the responsibility was everyone who came to class gave a penny. And if you couldn't afford your penny that week, your class teacher or class leader would pay your penny. So unless your class leader was really rich, you would try to come up with that penny. And John Wesley's rule was that unless you attended band and class, you were not allowed to come to society. What would our attendance look like if we said you can't come to our church gatherings if you are not really concerned with discipleship and meeting in a small group and with an accountability partner? Um, My guess is we would have a pretty small church and we wouldn't need this big building. But you know what? The church underneath of that system grew and made a huge difference in its world. Because they were not so focused about me, me, me. It wasn't so much the rich saying, I'm protecting what I have, and the poor saying, I want what you have. It was, what can we together do to accomplish the purposes of God in this world? Historians have looked at that and church leaders look back at John Wesley's system with awe and we wonder what can we do to create that passion for discipleship? And we ask the question, what broke that up? You know what the answer is? Superman. Let me read you a quote from a book that I'm reading called Transformational Church. 
The CEO Superman model of the church must be replaced by assigning a higher value on every man and woman. One reason that churches implode is because of the overpromise suggested by our Superman view of pastoral leadership. Our professional Superman pastor will be trained in exclusive places to gain expertise in business, family therapy, communication, marketing, leadership, and theology. The pastor will be taught how to lead local teams to spectacular church growth. A congregation has incredibly high expectations of their Superman. Superman returns the favor by having incredibly high expectations of the congregation. But when the dream is not accomplished, and notice it says when, not if, finger pointing begins. Both the pastor and the members contribute to the finger pointing. Angry pastors bemoan the terrible people in their congregations, demands unilateral command and control, then the church demands a higher level of customer satisfaction, fiscal, or fiscal stability, and numerical success, and no one gets what they want. And I'm just curious, did you see anything in there about discipleship? No. Transformational churches have strong leaders, but their leaders understand the importance of every man and every woman. Superman is for comic books, not the body of Christ. One of the big reasons why the body of Christ is not reflecting Christ is because in our culture, we say, well, that's the pastor's responsibility. I've worked as many 80, 90 hours a week as I, I can't work anymore in 90 hour weeks. I'm not supposed to. It's not the pastor's responsibility to do everything. Because if the thumb tries to run the body, you got a problem. The thumb is one part of the body, not the whole body. It takes the whole body, not just a thumb. You see, our church is not going to reflect Christ as long as the focus of our church is on the leadership. Leadership is important. I'm not saying that I'm quitting, but what I'm saying is that it's not up to me to do it all. It's not up to myself and Pastor Julie to do it all. It is about the body working together to do what is supposed to be done. What would it look like if the body of Christ worked together? You know, one of the things that scares me about the growth that our church has experienced, and I, and I feel like this is validated because when I left the church in McCook, it crashed. What if we build and we grow and great things happen, and then if God calls me on to somewhere, it crashes? What does that say about what I actually did in Davenport? It would say that I wasted a whole lot of time you know, for me, when I was getting ready to leave McCook, and I knew I was leaving, but I couldn't say anything, I started realizing, you know what, these 90-hour weeks I've been putting in here are kind of stupid. Because I'm paying a whole lot of attention to details that really don't matter. And I'm building up things that nobody's going to continue when I'm gone. Why am I doing this? I'm doing it because nobody else wanted to do it. And it needed to be done. The reality is that when we're lonely, when we're struggling with things, we need somebody to be there, don't we? When we're going through hard times, we need somebody to be there with us. Doesn't mean it's Superman's responsibility. Because just in case you're wondering, Superman's a myth. He's supported by ropes when he flies through the air. Or the green screen. Y'all know that, right? It's our responsibility as the body of Christ to work together. The problem is that we just have wanted somebody else to do it instead of accepting our responsibility to do it ourselves.
Paul finishes this chapter by saying this. So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. But now let, you show, let me show you a way of life that is best of all. That should grab our attention, shouldn't, shouldn't it? Let me show you a way of life that is best of all. This coming from the Apostle Paul. What does he have in mind? Pray tell. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had faith that could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. You see, here's the point. We get so caught up in our lives and what we want and what we think should be, and we neglect the most important piece, which is loving others. Why are we failing? Why are churches in America dying? Why are 70% of young adults stepping away from the church for at least a year? Why are 43% of those young adults not coming back to the church? Because there's nothing here for them. Church is not essential. Church is a waste of time in their minds. And quite honestly, the way that we've been doing church, they're right. Because it's not about discipleship, it's about a country club. It's about coming in so I can feel good about myself, temporarily relieve the reality that I'm messed up, and go out into the world and live for myself again another week. What we're called to, the reason that we're going through the New Testament in a year is so that we can see there's a bigger picture involved than me. Because if if the earth revolved around me, what happens the day after I die? Does the sun and stars just stop working? No. Life goes on because it wasn't all about me in the first place. Then Paul says this, Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. I'm going to replace that with the word disciples. And I want to read that again. Disciples are patient and kind. Disciples are not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. They do not demand their own way. They are not irritable and keep no record to being wronged. They do not rejoice about injustice, but rejoice whenever truth wins out. Disciples never give up, never lose faith, are always hopeful and endure through every circumstance. Our mission here is training disciples. We train disciples because we're a part of something bigger. Disciples mean that we are followers of someone. You are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are His disciples. You're supposed to look like Him. And when you put a whole bunch of us, little Jesus Christ, in the same room together as we come together, in case you're wondering, Christians, that word means little Christs. If you put a bunch of us Christians in a room together, man, you should have a whole lot of love and a whole lot of compassion and a whole lot of passion for things bigger than us. But what happens when you put a bunch of Christians in a room together today? We fight over what color the carpet is and what color we painted the walls. We fight over stupid things that really don't matter. Or we talk about other things that don't matter. You know, Dacian, the the encouraging thing is, five years from now, you won't even remember this game if I ask you about it. Just like I won't remember, actually I don't even remember last Sunday's game already. Funny how that works. You know, we talk about football. We talk about the weather. We talk about the Hawkeyes. 
We talk about stuff that doesn't matter because we're not going to remember it in a year. Jack, we were talking earlier about the Nebraska game. I'd forgotten that Nebraska lost to UCLA last Saturday. I'd forgotten that. I remember it now. It wasn't that big of a deal, but yeah, I'd forgotten. I thought they were still undefeated. We, we talk about stuff that doesn't matter. We argue about stuff that doesn't matter. So what's eternal? What's going to last? What's going to make a difference? Some messages that I preach, I want it to wrap up and I want us to leave here feeling encouraged and ready to do something. I don't want that this week. When you leave this place today, I'm intentionally bringing you to this point and I want you to feel unsettled about the church. I want you to feel unsettled about where you're at in your walk with Christ. And I want you to feel unsettled because quite honestly, we're not doing a very good job and we need to be unsettled. We need the tension of the reality that, that our bodies have to work together. Our body has to work together if we're going to accomplish the purposes that we've been given. What percentage of people work in the church and participate in the ministry of the church? Most people say that's around 20%. I think it's a little bit higher than our church. But let me ask you the question. How good would you feel if only 30% of your body parts were working? You choose the 30%, doesn't matter. How good would you feel if only 30% of your body parts worked? Or how good would you feel if all of your body parts worked at only 30%? What if your heart only pumped at 30%? You're not going to give very much blood to your limbs, are you? What if you got up and said, I'm only going to give 30% of my energy today. I'm only going to eat 30% of the food that I need to survive. You see, being a part of the body of Christ is bigger than living for me. Being a part of the body of Christ means that we recognize that every part is necessary. God has put every part just where it needs to be, and we need to work together in a loving way. Everybody feel unsettled? Everybody feel challenged? If our worship team will come forward, we're going to close with our song, I Refuse. And I hope that you pay attention to the words of this song this morning and not just go through the motions of singing them, but what would it look like if we refused to just get by? What would it look like if the body of Christ worked well together? And what would it mean for you? What would be different in your life if the body of Christ were working well together? Based on what you expect from the church and what you give to the church. Let's stand together as we sing.
As you walk out of this place today, you have two options. You can walk out, close your eyes, say, you know what, church is good enough as it is. I'm good enough as I am. Or you can acknowledge there's a whole lot of hurting people. There's a whole lot of hurting people within our church. There's a whole lot of hurting people in the world around us that need love, that need to truly see the body of Christ working well together. But it's our call. Heavenly Father, as I have studied this week, I have been deeply unsettled by the reality of this question. We have to ask this question because it's not going the way that it should. Help us to wrestle with this this week. What would it look like if we did our part so that the body of Christ could work well together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And you are dismissed.